I would like to really deep dive into the flow-based capacity calculation methodology, which is uh, which will be implemented uh, in a core capacity calculation region. Okay, so uh, firstly, I would like to talk a little about a little bit about the legal framework. Uh, based on which the core capacity calculation uh, methodology was created. So uh, there is the guideline on capacity allocation and congestion management, also called in short the CACM regulation from 2015, which uh, uh, let's say divided or based on which the Europe was divided into the capacity calculation region. And it was also decided that in the core capacity calculation region, which is shown on the picture, uh, the flow-based day ahead capacity calculation will be implemented. TSOs uh, prepared uh, their proposal for this, uh, this methodology and submitted it to the core NRAs, which was then with some amendments approved by the ACER decision in the February of 2019. And this is the I would say core basics of our methodology nowadays. And why I'm talking about basics, the, the reason is that meanwhile TSO submitted uh, already their first amendment, which uh, reflects, uh, I would say mostly some struggles uh, which we have encountered when implementing the methodology. And uh, so this first amendment was uh, submitted by core TSOs to core NRAs uh, and then later on approved in May 2021. Uh, and so when we will be talking now about the core capacity calculation methodology, I will be talking about the current status, which reflects also the changes uh, induced by the uh, first amendment from the May of this year. If you are interested in those methodologies, they are of course available online. Uh, either on the sites of the core NRAs or, for example, on the sites of NSOE. The capacity calculation consists of four main steps. First of all, it's the delivery of the computation data of the inputs from the core TSOs. This is really important because uh, Without uh, a proper uh, predictions and very precise prediction, no precise calculation can be can be done. Then these data are used to perform the calculation itself, which is uh, let's say step two. In the third step, TSOs has the right uh, and possibility to validate the results because the whole calculation is actually performed centrally by a coordinated capacity calculator, calculator and a TSO has, uh, I would say, no uh, possibilities to really check that the whole, the cal the whole calculation was, uh, uh, was performed uh, correctly. And so there is this uh, very important step of capacity validation. And then based on the feedback provided by the TSOs in the validation, the final com uh, computation is performed. This is quite general description, and we will get really into details of every step later. Uh, there are multiple actors involved in the process. This is also very important to mention at this point. Firstly, it's uh, the transmission system operators of the core capacity calculation region, or in other words, the core TSOs, whose responsibility is to calculate and, and provide the calculations. Then there are the regional security coordinators involved in the process, or shortly called the RSCs. In core capacity calculation regions, region, there are two RSCs, the companies TSCNet and Corizo, and they are uh, responsible for uh, merging the grid models, optimization of the non-cost remedial actions, and, and some other uh, uh, tasks, which we will describe later. Then there is this uh, really important role of the coordinated capacity calculator, CCC, uh, who performs the coordinated calculation. This task is performed by TSCNet and Coriza, who take, uh, who take turns in, in the calculation and provide also backup uh, for each other in case there would be some unavailability at sight of one of those. Last but not least, 
there is also the auction office involved in, in the process. The JAO provides the information about the capacities that were sold, allocated uh, in the long-term auctions, and is also responsible for a publication of the results. On this slide, uh, I would like to present you the whole day ahead capacity calculation process. I mean, you may be overwhelmed by all the boxes and timings and everything, but just don't be, because we will go in this presentation really for through each and every box in this schema, and uh, we will describe in, in detail what is done in every step of the day ahead capacity calculation in the core capacity calculation region. Uh, what I would like to, however, uh, show you on this picture and what is the message which I would like to deliver to you uh, in this slide is that the process is quite complex. That's the first message. The second one is that the process starts in uh, in D minus two in the evening and uh, continues through the whole night and morning till the morning of D minus one where when the capacities are uh, finalized uh, and published and provided to NEMOs. And then that there are uh, many parties involved in the whole process and different tasks are divided bit, uh, among, among them. So we can see different uh, rows in this, uh, in this scheme and uh, we can see that the rows are uh, allocated to different uh, participants. So core TSOs are responsible for the tasks which are in the first row, RSCs for the second row. The whole third row is then, then done in a coordinated manner by the uh, coordinate capacity calculator. And then there is also task uh, by Joe. So let's go to the first process of, of this uh, very complicated scheme. So first uh, process of the capacity calculation is the provision of the input data. Input data are provided by core TSOs and also by JAO. JAO provides information about the long-term capacities that were sold, in other words, allocated in the yearly and monthly auctions. This needs to be done at the beginning of the whole process. Then, uh, there are four basic inputs that are provided by the core TSOs. It's the individual grid model, which is the representation or prediction of how the network will look like in the, in the, in the day of delivery of the electricity. Then that's a list of external constraints, and then a file of gen generation load shift keys, and then uh, lastly, a list of critical network elements. So these inputs are really important because really quality and then of the input um, really determines then the quality of the outputs. And so for this reason, I would like to really go through these inputs one by one and uh, tell you what is included in, in them. So firstly, I would like to talk about the D2CF individual grid model. D2CF stands uh, for the fact that the model is a two day ahead prediction of the uh, status of the power grid. It includes best prediction TSO have, has uh, about the generation, about the load, about the grid topology, about the planned outages such as maintenance. Uh, and this is all in, in this file. It's actually 24 files because TSO uh, makes separate prediction for every hour of the day. The, this file is when provided to the to the process of capacity calculation is then merged by the mer uh, merging, uh, merging entity to create the common grid model, which is the, I would say, most crucial and fundamental input for the whole capacity calculation. Next input, which is uh, which can be submitted to the uh, capacity calculation process, are the external constraints. What are the external constraints? External constraints are allocation constraints that limits the maximum import and export 
uh, of a given giving uh, bidding zone. This external constraint can be used only in very specific cases. Uh, and those cases are when operational security limits cannot be really transformed efficiently into network elements limitation. So in other words, if the security limits in the network cannot be modeled by the critical network elements and they are ran. Usage of external constraints is uh, really limited to just few TSOs for whom the usage of these constraints was uh, allowed and approved by the core NRAs. And uh, those TSOs are also mentioned uh, in our capacity calculation methodology in the appendix, uh, where you can find also the justification why they need to use these external constraints. The third input uh, are the generation load shift keys. This is a file which describes how a change in a bidding zone net position is translated into a specific change of injections and withdrawal in the common grid model. In other words, it says that if a bidding zone net position is changed, which generation units and which load will participate on it and how much. So, uh, yeah. this, this file is defined by the core TSOs individually based on a historical behavior of these generation units and load units. And it is used uh, quite often in the capacity calculation process. And uh, as an example of, uh, of usage of this file, just imagine that you would need to change net position of one bidding zone by, by 10 megawatts. And uh, the question is how to do it. So the GLSK file uh, tells us which generation on which generation units uh, the production should be increased or on which units uh, or on which loads uh, the consumption should be decreased. The last but not least input file is the so-called CBCO area file. Uh, it's a list of a critical network elements with associated contingencies and also a list of non-costly remedial actions. So let's talk about each of, uh, of each part of the file separately. Uh, firstly, it's the list of the network elements with contingencies. By network elements, uh, we mean overhead lines, cables, and transformers. By contingencies, we, we mean unplanned outages, which are associated to those network elements. So in other words, fulfilling the N minus one criterion. On the lower part of the slide, I, I present you uh, an example of such a network elements list. So we see here four critical network elements. And in the first column, we have a unique identifier of each of these uh, critical network elements. In the second column, we see the name of the, of the element, which is a power line between uh, Hradec and Etzenricht, uh, so between uh, Czech Republic and Germany. And, and we see uh, that in the third uh, column that each of the line is defined twice. Firstly, in uh, one direction and in the opposite direction. So in direction from Czech Republic to Germany and then in direction from Germany to Czech Republic. To every uh, critical network element, a contingency can be associated or it, do not, it doesn't have to. And this we can see in the last uh, column, where we can see that the, the line from Hradec to Hetzenricht is firstly defined in a base case, which means without any contingency. And uh, therefore the values, the RAMs and PTDFs will be calculated for this connect for the situation which is in the common grid model. But for the connect number three and four, there is a con contingency associated. So there is a unplanned outage on the line between Pteštice and Hetzenricht. And uh, this means that 
to calculate RAM and PTF for this connect, there needs to be a change made in the common grid model. So in other words, an outage simulated for the line Prestice at Sandvik. The network elements with contingencies can be defined by TSOs uh, in two different manners. There are two types of the ne uh, network elements with contingencies. Firstly, they could be defined as the critical network elements with contingencies. And those critical network elements means that those elements are re relevant for the cross-zonal exchanges and should be uh, used for the flow-based uh, capacity calculation and then they can limit the flow-based domain. Uh, currently, those can be both internal and cross-zonal elements, but 18 months after the implementation and then later every two years, core TSOs uh, have to submit uh, a list of internal elements that they would like to keep as a critical network elements with a detailed uh, justification. And only if this justification uh, is um, acknowledged and those elements are approved, they can be used as a critical network elements. It's also possible to define a network elements as so-called monitored network elements, NECs. Those cannot limit the flow-based domain, but they are monitored during the non-cost remedial action optimization process, which we will get to it uh, later. Then the CBCO array file includes also uh, the non-costly remedial actions. Uh, non-costly remedial actions are changes in the grid topology and or also uh, phase shifting transformers. These will be these are provided in the CBCO array file and are used later on during a process of optimization of non-costly remedial actions. TSOs uh, have to provide all expected available non costly remedial actions to the process. After all the input data are provided to the process, then of course a data quality check uh, follows, where it is uh, checked whether everything is correctly submitted. There are actually two rounds of the check. First is the syntax check, where um, our files are uh, yeah, controlled whether they include all the uh, necessary fields and whether the format is correct. And then follows a more important coherence check. Uh, in, in this uh, stage, the, the files provided to the capacity calculation are checked for coherence uh, among each other. In other words, and or as an example, uh, just imagine that TSO sends a list of critical network elements for which uh, it is interested uh, to get RAM and PTDS, but at the same time, those critical network elements are not in the common grid, in the individual grid model, which was provided by the same TSO. So this is what the coherence check uh, controls. And if there is some error or some warning, it is provided back to the TSOs and TSOs have uh, opportunity to uh, correct their data and resend them again to the process. When all the input data are already uh, correct, then we can uh, proceed with merging of the inputs. And most importantly, merging of the individual grid models. So as every TSO sends uh, its own grid model with its best prediction for uh, two days ahead, then uh, it's necessary to merge all these models into one common grid model, which is used for the calculation. This task is performed by the RSCs in a role of merging entity. For the purpose of achieving a balanced CGM model, which is really important, uh, for this reason, we also shift the net position of the different bidding zones, so different IGMs, towards uh, a consistent forecasted net position. So 
there is a process where we forecast also the net position centrally and we shift uh, individual grid models of, uh, of the TSOs to this uh, precise forecast, which is not only precise, but also ensures that the whole common grid model will be balanced. And when uh, we have all the input data merged, we have a common grid model, we can proceed with a first flow base computation using those inputs. Why, we, why I talk about first flow base computation, uh, the reason is that during the flow base process, um, th there are multiple adjustments and the computation of the flow based parameters itself repeats multiple times. And therefore, uh, you will see in this presentation some um, extra descriptive adjectives uh, before the flow based computation, such as initial flow based computation, which is the first one. The result of the initial flow based computation is, uh, is the list of the critical network elements. And for every element, there is a uh, RAM, remaining available margin, and a matrix of PTDS. PTDS are coming simply from the situation in the common grid model. Uh, and they can be ex expressed in two forms. And as you will probably use some uh, flow base results, I would like to explain to you the difference between two forms of PTDS and the transformation between them. So there could be either zone to select PTDS which describes the sensitivity of the given network element to a change of the net position of one bidding zone. So how much more loaded will some element be in case the net position of one bidding zone will increase? Or they are the zone to zone PTDS, which I have presented already before in my first presentation, which describes the sensitivity of a network element to an exchange between two bidding zones. And of course, uh, those two uh, values or two representations can be linked one to each other. And uh, using the following equation, which we can see uh, on the bottom of the slide. So uh, if we would like to receive zone to zone PTDS uh, between bidding zone A and B, we can simply get it from the zone to select PTDS, which are very often uh, published. Uh, by just subtracting the PTDF, uh, zone to select PTDF for zone A and minus PTDF for zone to select B. Uh, and how we will get the RAM value? Okay, the RAM value will be obtained as we have already seen in the first presentation by simply subtracting from the uh, thermal capacity F max the flow reliability margin, so the reliability margin, and some default flows here uh, signed as F reference. And uh, as an example, we can see here a list of critical network elements, each of them having RAM, which was calculated as F max minus F FRM minus F reference, and a list of PTDFs for these elements. And on the right side of the slide, we can see a graphic representation how such a flow-based domain would look like. Similar slides will be presented also later in the presentation. Uh, yeah, just to be honest, I, I wanted to make the presentation as more uh, explanatory as possible, and therefore I always present to you firstly some theoretical slide explaining some sub-step of the flow-based capacity calculation, and then it will be followed by an explanatory slide like this one, where we will see what will happen to this initial flow-based domain later on in the capacity calculation. I would like to also draw your attention to the picture on the right, that there are two types of limitations. Some red limitations are in bold and some are a little bit shady. Both of those uh, limitations uh, are the connects limiting the flow-based domain. But it's obvious uh, from the picture that the shady lines are not efficiently, effectively limiting the flow-based domain. It's just the bold red one 
who are limiting the flow based domain. So when moving from the origin of the of the two axes, I will first reach one of the red ball thread limitation before reaching the uh, the shady one. And so the shady uh, limitations are actually not necessary for the calculation, and we can leave them out. For example, when providing the final flow based results to the NEMOs. It also helps us to improve the performance of the calculation. Yeah, to, to make it easier to distinguish between those two types of uh, limitations, so the bold one and the shady one, which is not really a nice uh, word how to uh, distinguish them, we call the, the bold one the pre-solved flow-based parameters and the shady one non-pre-solved. I may use uh, this term later in the presentation. After the first initial flow-based computation is performed, there is a possibility to, uh, we have already, okay, we have already the PTDFs, I'm sorry, we have already the PTDFs and RAMs. And at this point, we would like to filter out all the critical network elements whose zone-to-zone -zone PTDFs or maximum zone-to-zone -zone PTDF is smaller than 5%. Uh, why to do this? By, by filtering those uh, critical network elements, we uh, get rid of the elements which are actually not sensitive to cross-border exchanges, and therefore they are not relevant to the calculation. So if the PTDFs describes the sensitivity, then we can definitely uh, leave out those elements whose sensitivity is very low. And the, the threshold that we have set is 5%. To be completely uh, honest with you, th those elements are not completely uh, erased from the calculation, but their status is changed from critical network elements who can limit the flow-based domain just into a monitored network elements, which are monitored during the remedial action optimization. But we will still keep them in the calculation, but it will still help us to make the cal calculation more efficient. On an example, which is seen yeah, here on this, in this slide, we can see that there is some initial pool of critical network elements as they were provided by the TSOs, who provided a list of, uh, of uh, network elements and some contingencies associated to them. After the initial computation, we, uh, we will receive information about the PTDFs and the RAM values. And so we can uh, perform this uh, connect selection to get rid of the elements whose uh, maximum PTDF is smaller than 5%. When looking, for example, on connect number one, we see that the PTDFs are 12%, 10%, and 4%. So this element definitely fulfills the criteria and we can keep it in. in. But for example, for the element number eight, uh, there the maximum zone-to-zone -zone PTDF is just 3%. Therefore, we will not use it as a critical network element and it will stay just a, as a, a monitored network element. Yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, uh, Michal, again, um, for, uh, for this uh, first part. So there are different questions that uh, were coming in. Um, two of them are, are maybe easy uh, to be answered. Uh, what is the difference between core and non-core TSOs? And there was also a question about uh, core and uh, Denmark. Is, uh, core or is Denmark part of core? Um, so, so maybe the answer to this is there's a geographical scope of, of core and, and the countries that are represented within this um, uh, region uh, and all the TSOs that are part of this um, uh, geographical scope are also part of core. Uh, and that also makes a distinction with non-core TSOs. If, if they are not part of the geographical scope, uh, then we call them uh, non-core uh, TSOs. So Denmark would be a non-core TSO, but the input of uh, Denmark is uh, uh, at least considered uh, not this is exactly the same input as for the other core TSOs, but at least uh, the influence of uh, the exchanges uh, are uh, taken into account. 
Um, then there were a few questions about um, transparency. Uh, this will be dealt uh, with in the afternoon. Uh, so we think it's better to save those questions to the afternoon because most of them will already be, uh, be answered. Um, two short questions for, well, short. Two questions for you, Michael. Um, why cost of actions are not included in social welfare uh, computation and optimization? Yeah, so the, the reason why we use only the non-cost remedial action is, uh, I mean, there are m multiple reasons. Firstly, uh, we are afraid of the trade-off between uh, applying cost remedial action and then assuming what the welfare uh, to will or welfare gain would be from that because we are still D minus two. And second uh, option is that really at D minus two, uh, at D minus two, there is uh, there are no not in, there is not enough information about the availability of the remedial actions at that point in time where the non-cost remedial action optimization is performed. Thanks a lot. Uh, and there's also a question on the uh, Polish. Uh, I think it's called the, the technical uh, uh, constraints. So it's the combination of uh, um, and not not. Uh, um, only uh, something related to directly uh, core, and it's the question whether this will be remaining after core flow is day hat as well. Do you know this answer? Uh, yeah, the, uh, Poland is actually one of those countries who applies the allocation constraint or the external constraint, as is what mentioned, as one of the input data. And this is, I would say, partly used uh, as a virtual bidding zone, which is used nowadays in the interim coupling topology or uh, the technical profiles which are used nowadays. But in the flow base itself, there are no technical profiles and there are no virtual bidding zones for Poland. All right, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there were also still some questions uh, related to um, the uh, allocation uh, part. Um, uh, so maybe it's good also to, to give Adele the possibility to, uh, to answer, answer those. They were coming uh, uh, in a bit later. Uh, there's one on the uh, rollback um, uh, about um, the Czech Republic, uh, as an example at least. Uh, in case of a rollback, would you then return to the n c methodology for that specific country? So the answer is uh, yes. Actually, we will return to the n c methodology through the sending of uh, new n c a values by TSOs. As I said, TSOs will send two files. Uh, flow-based domain at zero and uh, LTA domain containing the the NTC value. So it's a little bit summarized, but uh, yeah, answer is yes. Good. And there's also a question on the intuitiveness uh, because, uh, in uh, for example, CDBE, uh, what was implemented in the past uh, is having a constraint for this, making sure that flow is always from a high a high price zone to a low price zone. Um, uh, will this remain in core? I think yes, then uh, I would prefer to double check after the sure. session to be sure, but uh, in my understanding is that uh, yes, it is the case. And, uh, and actually, in, in the accord will be plain eh, that will be uh, implemented eh, so that uh, so actually no additional constraint to, to force this flow somehow uh, that, is, uh, that is already decided upon in, uh, in core. Yeah. Um, one last uh, uh, question that is. Um, yeah, has there been measures taken into account so that uh, Euphemia can handle more complex computations, including flow-based? So not directly, I would say, but yes, uh, currently we are doing some technologic upgrade. Before call, we will have at least um, three different releases of Euphemia uh, that are transparent for market participants, but we are constantly uh, trying to improve Euphemia and the algorithm. And there will be some technologic upgrade, basically, to, to try to, to be more performant. But it's a continuous uh, optimization. So I would say indirectly, yes, uh, not directly. Thanks a lot, uh, Adele. So let's, let's uh, go back again to the, the next part of uh, the presentation of Michael. OK. Perfect. So when uh, the initial flow-based computation is performed and the connect selection filters out the elements which are not sensitive to the cross-border exchanges, then we can start with the optimization of the non-cost remedial actions. The goal of this optimization is to expand flow-based domain 
uh, on a, based on a, on an objective function of this optimization, so in a direction uh, where the, where the capacity is needed, and this is done by applying non-cost remedial actions. What are the non-cost remedial actions? Uh, these are the topological measures, which means changes of, uh, uh, I would say, topology or connections in the substation, substations. And then secondly, it's also uh, a changing top position of uh, PST uh, transformers, uh, the phase shifting transformers. This optimization is performed uh, automatically by two uh, algorithms which we have available. Did we call them CRAAO and HS? Those two algorithms uh, are provided uh, by one by Corizo, one by, by TSCNet. And although they have the same uh, objective function and st same constraints, uh, they use different approach, different algorithm to obtain the, the result. And uh, when so it, it happens that they ended up with uh, different uh, results and therefore we have their uh, special module called trial selection module, which for every hour checks the results from the uh, Crowell and HS and compares them and takes only the, the best result for every hour, which is then uh, used for further computations. Um, in the RAL, only the non-cost remedial actions that were provided by the core TSOs at the beginning of the calculation are uh, considered, and the resulting um, set of remedial action is actually applied to the common grid model, which is then later used for the calculation. At this point, I would like to uh, mention that uh, the fact that NRAO chooses some uh, remedial action, it doesn't mean that those uh, remedial action uh, have to be activated in the real time as well. The reason is that uh, RAO also have some assumptions when applying those remedial action, but no one knows what will be the real outcomes of the day ahead market coupling, which can be they shouldn't be, but it can be different from our assumptions. And what is more, there is uh, the D minus one operation of security analysis performed by the TSOs, where it is decided what remedial actions will be actually applied in the final um, for the real operation. On an example of the flow based domain, Let's assume that we have the, the domain from the initial flow-based computation, and our objective function says that we should uh, increase uh, the flow-based capacity in the direction of the black arrow. If, it's, if it is the case, and there, then there are some remedial actions which can uh, increase the capacity in that direction, then they will be applied by the NREL, and it will result in, a, in an increase of the capacity in that direction. But it is also very important to mention that uh, it will probably also decrease capacity on some other, uh, another element. Because by uh, applying non-cost remedial action, uh, the net position of the core bidding zones is not changed. So the amount of electricity that is produced and that is consumed is still the same. But what is changed is the way how the flows uh, goes go through the network, because either when applying topological measures, the real topology of the network uh, changes, or by applying PSTs, just some parameters. In other words, we can say some parameters of some lines changes, and so the flows goes in different direction. In uh, on on our uh, flow-based domain in a, in. A, in the Excel, it has that impact that this reference flow or the F0 core is changed because the, the flows which are in the network will flow differently. Then follows the intermediate flow-based computation. Why to recompute the, the flow-based domain? Uh, this is quite obvious because we have changed the uh, critical network elements list because we have filtered some in, insensitive uh, elements. 
That's first. And secondly, we have a little bit different common grid model because we have applied non-cost remedial actions to it. And so when we reperform the flow-based computation, we will get a little bit different results than we get, we have uh, got from the uh, initial flow-based computation. So the result of the intermediate flow-based computation is the set of uh, RAMs and the PTDFs again. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that up to this point, the whole calculation was based on the pure physical laws. So we used the common grid model, and in that model there are um, real electric parameters of the lines, and based on that we calculated how the flows will uh, flow and what the, uh, what the PT devs will be. But after the intermediate flow-based computation, there are two steps which leads to uh, increase of the flow base capacity uh, based on some legal requirements and this increase is from my perspective artificial and can lead to a potential uh, risky uh, capacity from the point of view of operation security. Those two steps are the adjustment for minimum RAM and the, and the inclusion of the long-term allocation allocated capacities. And let's get to those steps uh, right away. So uh, first of these steps is the adjustment for minimum RAM. The aim of this step is to secure that the specific percentage of the thermal capacity of all elements is reserved for the commercial, commercial exchanges. Uh, and by commercial exchanges, we mean both uh, the core commercial exchanges and commercial exchanges outside the core capacity calculation region. Uh, in our capacity calculation methodology, there are two conditions related to this aim. One is coming from the uh, clean energy package from the Article 16 of the Regulation 2019-943, which says that at least 70% of uh, cross owner capacity should be available for commercial exchanges. Of course, if a derogation or an action plan is not granted, then the, this percentage can be lower for some period of time. And uh, our core capacity calculation methodology goes even beyond this uh, very strict requirement. And it says that we should also guarantee that uh, there is a 20% of uh, the thermal capacity uh, available for the internal core commercial exchanges. So 70% uh, for all commercial exchanges and at the same time 20% for internal core commercial exchanges. Uh, in, in the computation, this uh, condition is uh, done by increasing artificially the RAM value uh, by a capacity adder which is called adjustment for the minimum RAM, or in short, AMR. Uh, this uh, here on the lower part of the slide, I would like to present you the real equation which is used in our algorithm to ensure that the 70% and 20% requirement is followed. So the AMR is this adder, and it is calculated as a maximum of three parts. Uh, let's start from the from the end of the, of the bracket. So it's either zero, which makes uh, sure that the AMR is always uh, non-negative. In other words, that is always increasing the RAM, not never uh, decreasing it. Uh, then there is uh, the second uh, or the middle part. And here we can see in the bracket F max minus FRM minus F0 core. So this is in other words, RAM. So it says that 20% uh, of a thermal capacity minus RAM is the AMR. So if the RAM is smaller than 20% of the max, we will get positive value, which will be the AMR by which we will be increasing the, the, the RAM. And then we have the first uh, row, which describes the complicated uh, requirement of the clean energy package. This RAMR is 70%. Or if there is derogation or action plan granted, it can be some lower value. Let's assume 50, 70, 70, 60. It can be anything based on the, on the derogation or action plan. 
And uh, an FUAF is, uh, are the flows which are coming from the non-core exchanges, commercial exchanges. So in other words, the first row says that if we subtract from the 70% requirement, the non-core commercial exchanges and the RAM, what we will get, if it's a positive value, that's how much we should increase our RAM to ensure that 70% is granted for the commercial exchanges. Uh, yeah. On an example of a calculation, uh, we can see that just uh, yeah. that uh, let's assume that for CNEC uh, number four and five, there is a requirement that 55% of uh, thermal capacity should be uh, offered for commercial exchanges. By pure calculation of uh, RAM as a Fmax minus FRM minus F0 core, we will get that the RAM is 500 megawatts. And so, therefore, there is a AMR error applied 50 megawatts to increase the RAM to the requirement of 55%, let's say. So this is just artificial uh, increase of the, of the capacity, which is not based on any uh, physical computation or some physical laws in the, in the network. And this can be, of course, potentially risky for, uh, for the operation of a grid with such capacities. And this will be uh, handled uh, later in the capacity calculation. So the uh, Q&A again, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Michel. Um, again, several questions uh, came in. Um, there was a question on the IGMs, uh, in general, an input if, if that is uh, uh, missing. Uh, so, so maybe shortly on, on this, uh, for IGM, there are, you can say, replacement strategy, uh, meaning that if a single input is missing, uh, this can be uh, replaced. Uh, and that's such backups are defined for many of the, uh, the inputs. Um, um, then there's also a question uh, for you, Michel. Um, can you give a more concrete example what exactly put in the FRF flow? Um, for example, with regards to the, uh, the DA Swiss uh, uh, flows, uh, is it then the case indeed that uh, these flows, since Swiss is not part of core, would affect the RAM on a core net element between Germany and Swiss? Yeah, so there are actually, I, I understand it as a two, two questions. Firstly, the, the reference flow initially is uh, represents all the um, predictions uh, on on flows that we have in uh, in the grid. So when we take the merge grid, so what are the flows there? So this is uh, F reference, which is used in the initial steps of the calculation, and it's really important for the remedial action optimization. It is later on in the calculation, and then for provision to the market participants and and NEMOs, it's then not used anymore, and it's instead we use the F0 core, which are just the uh, internal flows and uh, non-core exchanges, as it was described in the original presentation. Regarding uh, the influence of Switzerland, this is a quite specific topic, because uh, with uh, there is a cooperation between Switzerland and core region, and we plan to implement uh, some uh, coordination uh, in the capacity calculation. Uh, in other words, uh, the capacity calculation process of Switzerland and CORE will communicate with each other, and we will share information uh, about our connects. Uh, yeah. Good, um, thanks. And then maybe uh, related to this, um, yeah, there's also a question on if for the TSOs that have this link to third countries, if flow based is the, the yeah the best providing the best outcomes in terms of operational security and cost effectiveness, and, and I think the answer is here a little bit that for the core internal borders, eh, because the core is a meshed grid, yeah, eh, flow based is seen as the, the best uh, solution, and having this uh, and a connection to the external borders, this is something you simply have to deal with somehow. Uh, so indeed, this combination is still seen as the most uh, effective um, uh, setup. Um, then uh, a short question on RAW. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the selection of the, the RAW. Uh, you take the one that's giving the best results. What means the best results in this perspective? Uh, yeah, as I've mentioned, um, 
non-constrained medial action optimization have, uh, has an objective function, which is described uh, in detail in our capacity calculation methodology. I would not like to go really much into detail what's the objective function because it's quite complicated. It's just some maximizing of minimal relative prime in short, which is quite complicated. <laughs> but uh, uh, as this is the, the objective function of the optimization, then we can, based on the value of this objective function, choose easily which of the tool is better. Yeah, and better means then uh, providing uh, more capacities then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I need better I think means providing more capacity and in other words, it's uh, having better value of the objective function. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, last question. Uh, what is the typical number of connects uh, for core before and after pre-solving? Uh, that's a tricky one. I have never analyzed that, but I would say that before pre-solving, it can be thousands. Uh, of connects, you know, five, six thousands, uh, maybe more even. Yeah. And after pre-solving, it's like one, two hundreds. Yeah, well, I think that gives a, an, an, an idea on the, the, the size of, uh, of this and the numbers, uh, of course. Uh, good, then I think we uh, can continue to the next part. Mm -hmm. So uh, next part of uh, the capacity calculation is the long-term allocation inclusion. What are the long-term allocations? Those are the transmission capacities that were sold, or in other words, allocated, during the yearly and monthly auctions. And uh, when, when allocated, uh, their owners have right to use them, to really use them for physical transmission of electricity, uh, in other words, to nom nominate them, or not nominate them in case uh, that they are physical transmission rights, or even if they are, and if they are a financial transmission rights, those cannot be nominated. And if the long-term allocations are not nominated, TSOs shall remunerate the the owners of these rights with uh, the price spread of the day ahead market. So, in other words, uh, in the day ahead market, TSOs. Uh, receive money, uh, which is called the congestion income, uh, which is based on the price spread between the bidding zones. And using this uh, this income, TSO shall re remunerate the long-term transmission rights holders for those rights that were not nominated, that were bought, allocated, but they were not nominated. Either because uh, uh, owners didn't want to nominate them or because those were just uh, financial transmission rights that cannot be nominated. What can, however, happen is that the long-term rights that uh, have been already sold in the yearly and monthly auctions are larger than the capacity that were calculated in the day ahead capacity calculation process. This can happen uh, quite easily because uh, there are different assumptions which are available to TSOs a year ahead or month ahead. And uh, in a daily operation or day ahead operation, a TSO has more precise data available. But then the question is what to do in such a situation because uh, this would lead to the uh, issue that if, because we as a TSO, uh, TSOs have to be prepared for the situation where none of the LTA long-term allocations are nominated and then that they all have to be remunerated. But if the long-term allocations are larger than the flow-based domain, then it can happen that uh, there will be not enough money collected in the day ahead uh, auction or in the day ahead uh, market coupling. And for this reason, it is necessary to increase the flow-based domain in such a way that it always covers fully the uh, LTA domain. And there are multiple ways how to do this. And uh, in core capacity calculation, we have considered two approaches. Firstly, we, we considered something called the LTA margin approach, which was used in the original core day head capacity calculation methodology, but in the amend uh, amended uh, methodology, it is used only as a temporary or rollback option. And the reason is that this, uh, this approach 
can be potentially very risky from the operational uh, security perspective. LTA merging, merging just works in the way that the RAM of a connect, uh, of a given connects, is increased in the way uh, that the LTA margin is completely inside the flow-based domain. So on the example on the left side of the slide, we see that the LTA domain goes beyond the flow-based domain. And to solve this issue, we could just increase RAM on connect number two. And by doing so, we would just shift it in parallel to its original position a little bit up so that uh, the LTA domain would be fully covered in the flow-based domain. But by doing so, we would not only include the LTA domain into the flow-based domain, but at the same time, we would uh, also introduce a lot of extra capacity to the flow-based domain, which are not based on any uh, uh, technical calculation and are therefore potentially risky and can cause issues in the, in the network from the so from the perspective of operational security, this is undesired solution. Uh, therefore, there is a, a better way how to perform the inclusion of the long-term allocations. And this better solution is called the extended LTA formulation. So if we look at the same example as we had before on the left side or on our side, now there is a convex hull which is a blue line created that covers the LTA domain, so adds, adds it into the flow-based domain, but at the same time adds a minimum of a potentially risky capacity, which are the yellow points, which are under the blue line that have not been originally in the LTA domain nor in the flow-based domain. This uh, concept of the extended LTA was already proved in CWE that it actually leads to comparable minimax and net position and welfare with the virtual branches approach that is used nowadays in the, in the CWE. Unfortunately, in the core capacity calculation region, it is not possible to determine uh, directly uh, the convex hull. And so uh, when we uh, like to apply the extended LTA formulation, the result of the flow-based calculation are two domains. Firstly, it's the flow-based domain without LTA inclusion, and then separately the LTA domain. And then when this data are handed to Euphemia, then the market coupling algorithm called Euphemia automatically performs the LTA inclusion when uh, optimizing the day ahead market. Yeah, so uh, the biggest benefit of the extended LTA formulation in comparison with uh, another ways how to include LTA domains into the flow base the domain is that it fulfills completely the coverage of the LTA domain but at the same time, it just really limits the extent of potential and secure, we call it virtual capacity. On an example, uh, it would look, so after the LTA inclusion, the flow-based results would look like this. So we would have two domains as a result of the flow-based computation, the pure or sometimes referred to as a virgin flow-based domain and the LTA domain. And maybe you are wondering, um, yeah, that's nice that there will be two domains, but how to work with that? How to uh, find out whether some uh, market clearing point or market point in general lies in the convex hull, if this convex hull cannot be described. Uh, and here I would like to present to you a, a so-called BALAS approach, which is a helper function uh, to understand the extended LTA formulation. It is a way how to verify uh, whether a given market point is feasible by the day ahead cross zone capacities or in other way by the capacities formed by the LTA domain plus the flow based domain. The BALAS approach is actually a linear optimization algorithm. 
here I would like to describe you a little bit the, the function, how the linear optimization algorithm works so that you can uh, create it yourself if you are interested in, in checking the, the capacities. So first uh, assumption of this process is that the net position between of the, the net position that I would like to check, so the market point, can be divided between the LTA domain and the flow base domain. So I can split it. And then also the limitations of the flow base domain, so the RAMs, and the limitation of the LTA domains, which are some NTC values, can be scaled by a coefficient alpha, which is uh, between zero and one. And so one domain is scaled by alpha and second one is one minus alpha. And if we set an uh, objective function that we would like to maximize our market point, which we would like to check, and put there a constraints that uh, flow resulting from the LTA market point is uh, smaller than the scaled LTA domain, and that the flow resulting from the flow base market point is smaller than the uh, flow base domain, and we run this optimization, we will get uh, uh, a maxim, like our market point maximized. By that mean, we will get a market point which lies directly on the borders of the uh, ballast domain, so of the convex hull. So an example here on the left, so if we start in a point one, uh, with the optimization, we will end up in the point A with hyphen, so at the at the edge of the uh, extended LTA domain. If we would start already in point three, for example, which is outside the flow base domain, then by the optimization, we uh, and fulfilling the this criterion which were described, uh, we would end up in the point three with hyphen, so at the borders of the domain. Thanks again, uh, um, Michael. Um, so uh, one question uh, remaining, and also for the for the uh, participants, uh, the Q and A will be um, also published uh, after the meeting. Um, Michael, can you put your camera on? I have one question for, for you. It would be good to see you. Um, so um, it says we were told that in a domain space, every line representing a connect and its slope can represent PTDF. Can you define mathematically this slope? So I think they're referring to the coefficients, the PTDF coefficients, and if you can mathematically define this. Of the of the connects? Yes, yes indeed. It's, it's possible to, to, to do it. Yeah. So the answer so, you, so for example, in two-dimensional dim space, it's it's just a line. So it's very easy to determine two points in, in the space um, and then, then just draw a line. Yeah. Now, and I think uh, uh, part of this probably will also be dealt with in the afternoon in the publication uh, 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 transparency part. Uh, I think the combination of net oppositions and the changes of this uh, uh, and, uh, and the coefficients of the PTDS, I mean, making this link, then indeed you could uh, yeah, define this, uh, this automate, the slope is already defined, but you could also visualize th this indeed. But maybe after the afternoon's presentation, this becomes even more uh, clearer. Um, it's uh, still one question. I'm getting informed um, on the issues of LTA potentially ending up to be too large. Uh, uh, how is it ensured that the enlargement is not discriminatory against implicit allocation of cross-zonal capacities? Um, also, are the amendments made to solely address real physical constraints or in parts to alleviate indirect economic risk of TSOs due to ESDA congestion revenues? Uh, ending up in a few cases uh, lower than required LTA. It's a long qu question. Did you catch it, uh, uh, Michael? Or? I got some parts of it, so <laughs> I will try to answer a yeah. bit. But I, I think that the question is quite complex, so it would be better to answer to it in detail after the workshop. But in general, we, by introducing the LTA inclusion, we are just increasing the domain so that there is enough capacity in the day ahead market in a case that the capacity is not nominated. But it doesn't mean that we would uh, reserve this capacity for some purpose. It just means that we will increase the capacity which is then provided to the market. Good. 
Uh, thanks. Uh, maybe we'll uh, answer some more uh, questions uh, uh, later on, but uh, good to now move, uh, move forward to the next uh, part. Okay. Perfect. So the next step of the Fovis uh, computation is the validation. Uh, as I have already uh, mentioned in the in the beginning of the of my presentation, the whole process is centralized, performed by the uh, capacity calculation coordinators, and TSOs uh, are or um, how to say? I mean, uh, the involvement of TSOs in the whole process is quite limited to some some pr uh, few some uh, sub processes. So TSOs sends sent in the input data and then. Uh, after the intermediate phone based computation, they have possibility to validate the results. Uh, objective of the validation is to ident identify and apply measures for resolving the potential vi uh, violation of operational security uh, in the intermediate flow based domain. And uh, yeah, this can really be the case because, as it was mentioned in the uh, last 10 minutes, uh, there are some steps which artificially increase capacity beyond the physical nature of the grid. And uh, this increase can be potentially risky. And uh, yeah, we can we can honestly say here that it can be risky, it doesn't have to be. And that's actually the, the reason why there is a validation. Uh, and in this step, TSO uh, shall use all their expected available non-costly remedial action, but also the costly remedial actions such as redispatch. To, to check whether the capacities calculated uh, by the intermediate flow based comp computation and enlarged by the adjustment for minimum RAM and LTA inclusion are really secure from the operational point of view. And uh, in, uh, the validation itself consists of two uh, steps. Firstly, it's the coordinated validation, and then there is also an individual validation. Um, Coordinated validation is performed by the coordinated capacity calculators, RSEs, in cooperation with TSOs. Uh, and uh, the aim of this validation is to firstly exchange information on uh, those expected available remedi remedial actions, which uh, all TSOs uh, have to send to the RSEs. And then using those RSEs, uh, those, uh, sorry, using those uh, remedial actions, RSCs uh, validate whether the flow-based domain is secure. But if there are not sufficient remedial actions to uh, secure uh, security of the system, then uh, it's possible that relevant TSOs in coordination with the capacity calculation coordinator may apply uh, some validation adjustment called CVA, Coordinated Validation Adjustment, and by that, decrease the RAM. Uh, yeah, to put it more simplified, just, uh, yeah, so let's say RSCs take the capacities and try to check in the network what, that, what would it mean if all the capacities were used fully in some direction. That's also based on some of our expertise and, and predictions. And if those capacities were fully used, will the network will be will be overloaded? And if yes, will we have sufficient remedial actions to solve these uh, overloads? If yes, it's fine. If not, if there are not in sufficient remedial actions to solve uh, the overloads, and another probably also uh, issues with security, which can uh, occur in the network, then uh, there is a possibility to decrease a run a bit. There is actually a gradual implementation of this coordinated validation. So initially there will be just simplified approach for the first years of operation, which uh, uh, consists of exchange of information on the available remedial actions. So TSO sends their remedial actions to the RCs and RCs then distribute them uh, to the TSOs back. They merge them and distribute them back so that TSOs can use them in their individual validation. Later on, there will be a full approach, which will include also the coordinated assessment, as I have described it just a few seconds ago. Uh, this full approach uh, 
is not uh, specified in detail yet, but there will be a TSO proposal uh, prepared and uh, it should be prepared uh, at latest by 18 months after implementation of the core flow based market coupling. Uh, after that follows the individual validation, which is already now in, in place and it's working. Uh, this validation is performed by the TSOs individually for their own control area and TSOs uh, can apply some individual validation adjustment, also decreasing the RAM in uh, four uh, explicitly mentioned situations. Firstly, it's if there is some occurrence of an exceptional contingency or force outage or where all available remedial actions are not sufficient to ensure operational security. In exceptional cases, if there are some uh, big mistakes in the input data that would lead to an overestimation of the capacities, or uh, that if there were a potential need to cover reactive power flows on certain connects. In very exceptional cases, there is also possibility for TSOs to add internal critical network elements into the final list of critical network elements. And this is possible only if all remedial actions are not sufficient to ensure operation security and uh, operation security on an internal network element. So this, but this point would apply more later when it will be allowed to have just the cross zone elements in the flow based computation. And in some exceptional cases, we would add uh, an internal line. Of course, I would like to ensure you that uh, application of this individual validation adjustment is subject of uh, detailed reporting, both to NRAs and uh, also to you, to all the market participants. So application of uh, IVA together with a justification will be available on Java publication platform for you. Uh, how an application of IVA looks like uh, on a flow-based domain, it's just an, another component to the equation how to calculate the final RAM value. So the final RAM, RAM value is calculated as a RAM before validation from which we would subtra subtract uh, coordinated validation adjustment and the individual validation adjustment. On, uh, on the picture of the flow-based domain, it would just mean that the sum uh, connect limitation would be moved closer to the uh, origin. Good, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Michel. Uh, m minding the time, uh, we cannot uh, answer too many um, uh, uh, questions. There were still some questions on the, the BALAS uh, method, um, uh, especially uh, about, yeah, is the domain, uh, LTA domain included in the final PTDF uh, domain, and also why it's needed to, to have this separation uh, uh, of those two domains? And uh, I think the short answer would be uh, there are two domains uh, uh, indeed, so it's not that the one is included in the other, there are two separate domains you can say sent for um, market coupling and this is because it's more efficient to let the market coupling algorithm check those uh, constraints rather than merge them uh, first during capacity calculation. So that is the main reason and it's also not that there are two market clearing points but two market points, so there are two domains that's maybe um, important to, uh, to highlight. Um, Let's uh, maybe continue uh, to the next part, uh, Michael. Okay, so uh, after the uh, validation, uh, we have, let's say, another input for the uh, computation, and so we can perform uh, a pre-final pre flow-based computation, which uh, takes uh, as an input all the uh, data from the previous computation and extra of course, also the information uh, from the individual and coordinated validation. The result of this computation is the flow-based uh, domain, let's say the, this pure pre-solved flow-based domain and also the LTA restrictions or the LTA domain. And these uh, values can be, let's say, considered as a, as a final, the only missing piece of puzzle are the information about how many capacities, long-term capacities were actually nominated, which is not available at this time. But besides, the, the values are already final, and so they are also uh, already sent to job uh, site for publication. A little bit later, 
when all the long-term nominations are available, uh, the final flow-based computation follows. And uh, the, it means that the flow-based domain, LTA domain is recomputed. And from the result, the long-term nominations, so how many long-term capacities were really nominated, is subtracted. And so we will then receive the real final capacities. Uh, on an example, let's assume that we have a, a flow-based domain, uh, an LTA domain, so the final flow-based capacities, and uh, to subtract uh, the long-term nominations, we can understand it that some capacities were already solved and used and should therefore not be, let's say, uh, offered to the market one more time. And so, in other words, we will uh, subtract the long-term nomination both from the flow base and LTA domain. Graphically, that it means it's similar to shifting the flow base domain uh, in the space. Uh, after we have the final flow base domain, the results are published and sent also to Nemos to perform the market coupling. Uh, I would like to also inform you that we have some fallback uh, options available in case there is some issue with the flow-based capacity calculation. Uh, fallback can be triggered in case there is a technical failure with the tool, with the central tool. There could be also some error in the communication or corrupted or missing input data. We are prepared for all these uh, tasks or these problems. And if they occur, we have, I would say, uh, three possible fallbacks in our sleeves uh, based on the severity of the problem. So first of them is to reuse the initial flow base uh, computation results for the final flow base computation. That's if there is some issue in uh, some of the sub steps during the calculation. If on the other hand, there is some real fail of some timestamp during the flow base computation, we can either uh, use spanning or default flow base parameters. Spanning is a, is a method that is applied in case the flow base uh, computation fails strictly for less than three consecutive hours. And in that case, we would just use as a fallback a union of previous and subsequent available flow base parameters all and all LTA domains. So this can be seen on then on the picture below on the slide. So let's assume that we had uh, successful computation for timestamp one and timestamp three, but the computation failed for some reason for timestamp two. In that case, uh, we would uh, use uh, spanning to get some values for the timestamp two. And so we would take union of the uh, timestamp one and three, which is the red uh, uh, shape polynomial in, uh, in the middle that would be used. If there are uh, more uh, failed hours than if there are three or more uh, consecutive missing hours, then we would have to apply the full, default full base parameters, which are uh, NTC capacities based on LTA capacities, which are increased by some adjustment values, which are provided uh, by uh, TSOs for every border they have, and then by harmonization principle, those adjustment values uh, would be selected. So we would take smaller from the two adjustment values for a border, and then the adjustment would be added to LTA capacities. So that's, uh, I would say, the most, the last uh, default parameter. Uh, 